Okay, that was I'm really on it today. I'm on it today. today. Well, if you're just tuning in, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ruby Veridiano, and this is my new series, Grit and Glamour. It's really about honest conversations that show the grind toward the glow up that you don't see on the gram. I feel like right now we're navigating a lot of uncertainty and we often don't see what the process actually looks like. And so in, you know, as a result, we fall into the comparison trap. Um, and I just wanted to kind of pull the covers back a little bit and share the stories of the most brilliant people that I know, one of them being my dear friend, Sarah Nguyen of the Nguyen Coffee Supply Company. She's streaming in from where? Brooklyn! Yes, but she represents what? Boston! <laughs> <laughs> So we got East Coast in the house and I'm here uh, representing West Coast, California, but streaming from where I live in Paris, France. Um, so again, if you're joining, thank you so much. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna let you do your own introduction because I feel like I'm gonna do more introduction. I'm gonna slowly peel the onions of your multifaceted uh, life through our interview. So we're gonna okay. just kind of let it kind of marinate and have a slow burn. So I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and then um, I'm gonna let you, uh, and I'm, go I'm gonna follow up later with the unpeeling. Okay. All right, thank you so much, love. Um, I wasn't prepared with introduction, but I guess I'll start with, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm the founder of Nguyen Coffee Supply. We're an importing and roasting company focusing exclusively on Vietnamese coffee beans. Um, our goal is to really increase the representation, visibility and transparency of Vietnamese coffee producers, people and culture in the world. Um, and so and we do that by uh, importing green beans, working directly with producers and farmers and roasting them fresh in Brooklyn. And previous to this, like Ruby and I have just have been friends for over a decade now. So we have just been through so much together. And before I started Union Coffee Supply, I've also worked as a full-time documentary, documentary filmmaker, as you know, uh, I worked in student affairs at UCLA. I worked as a community organizer and um, I, I'm a lifelong activist. So we've done a lot of different, I've done a lot of different things, which I'm sure Ruby will dive into. Yes, and definitely I know, um, even if I didn't know you, I would be like, is that CEO an activist in an Asian American studies major? Oh my God, <laughs> wow, wait, you, from the messaging of New from the messaging, I mean, one, you know, you are such a skilled storyteller, but I think the lens, right, like there's yeah. the lens in which we deliver the messages really matters, yeah. and it's very clear, I think, that you have a, a background that I think pulls all of your different um, oh, that you makes know, me so happy together. together. Thank you so much for reflecting that Rubes. Like that makes me really happy to hear that you you feel that lens. So oh, that's amazing. Yes. And I was gonna and another fun fact really quickly because your brand is built around your family name. Um, so tell me again how you pronounce it. So I honestly fluctuate between Nguyen or Nguyen, or Nguyen, which is the Vietnamese version. Well, I just wanted to share, and I, I'm asking that because so many people have this last name, but where I live in France, I was surprised to hear a very different pronunciation. So fun fact for y'all listening, in France, they pronounce it Nguyen. So. <laughs> which I love so much, I think it's so cute. Because you know, my parents actually pronounce it Nguyen. Oh. Which is like not really a common version in the U.S., yeah. but I grew up with mostly Nugent. So I will say, though, when people ask me this, like, how do you uh, say your last name? I always say, you know, they're all anglicized versions. Mm -hmm. So they're all no more right or wrong to me. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is Vietnamese is a tonal language in the tones in Nguyen just don't exist in the English language. That's why there's not really a right or wrong anglicized version. There's just a more popular or less popular version. So Nguyen or Nugen are all, um, you know, um, I guess interpretations of it, but yeah. they all work if we're not no. gonna say in the tonal language. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but just really quickly, because I feel like this last name is so common, why are there so many people with that last name, given that it's such a cornerstone and obviously a pillar of your brand? Yeah, you know, it was, um, from my understanding of Vietnamese history, it was the last dynasty um, that ruled Vietnam. Wow. And so that's why so many people have it. Mm -hmm. Got it. So you continuing that dynasty. You know, wow. we try. <laughs> we 
love it. Okay, well, um, I want to start off by what we just talked about. We just covered all of your different backgrounds, right? Yeah. Um, my introduction to you was we were spoken word artists, you mm-hmm. know, um, many moons ago, and we and now there's a lot more. Vis- there, there, we're still working our way towards you know visibility, but there's a lo- definitely a lot more Asian American visibility now than we had 10 years ago. But what we did have was like that national summit of Asian American poets. And yeah. uh, that's where I found my heroes, um, including yeah. you. Yeah. So, um, but you, you, you have this, you, you started off as an artist. Um, I know that you also, uh, obviously you were your filmmaker and for a long time, that was your path, you know, the filmmaking, but, and then in between that, you have your activist work, you've worked with students, uh, which extends, which t- totally makes sense why you do so much work at universities. Um, there's so many different hats that you've worn. Have you ever felt in the course of your journey that you felt lost or that you doubted your path because switching from one hat to another felt really random? Um, you know, like, I feel like some people, are uh, very uh, interested and committed to pursuing one path and not veering towards it. And it feels yeah. really crazy for maybe, you know, from people looking um, from the outside in into our paths that we've kind yeah. of like swerved so many times. So for you, like, how did you, you know, how did you reflect on that kind of swerve? Yeah. yeah. To answer your question, yes. Like so many times and all the time, um, I've, I felt really lost and confused in my really multifaceted um, creative career, you know, over the last 10 years. And I think a lot of it has to do with one society's norm convention has been about like choosing one path or one lane, right? Like that's a conventional um, expectation. So when you're so naturally, you already feel confused or lost because it doesn't feel like the norm, right? And then but also, I think there just weren't a, enough um, models or mm-hmm. reflections or representations of people who have led or and successfully led multifaceted careers or lifestyles. Exactly, like, exactly why we're doing this. Right, yeah. And <laughs> you don't see yourself reflected, of, like when I didn't see myself reflected, it makes me question myself, you know, or makes me question my path of like, is this possible? You know, and like anything in life, if you've never seen it done, you've never seen like an, you know, a woman president or like an Asian American, like pop star or, or anything, right? It's like, can it be done? Right. So yeah, of course, there were so many, I mean, if anything, I, I, I would feel like it was almost like 50, 50, like the uncertainty and the doubt with like the aspiration and like the drive, like it was just a constant um, challenge really in, in my path. Yeah. And then on top of that, there's also when you can't see an example of what your version of success is, you don't know how to do it. Yeah. Right. Like, how have you felt around like because when people follow a particular path, like, for example, if you want to be a doctor or an accountant, there are certain markers of success. Yes. That is already available for them because that path is so structured. Yeah. How have you felt around like that kind of absence of that structure? Such a great question. Um, you know, it it has been an ongoing struggle, you know, like you, you really hit the nail on the head there when like you, we didn't like, there just aren't, there isn't that structure. So there aren't like those points affirming you, like you're on the right path, you're doing it right. Like unlock the next level and then like the next level. Right. So yeah, it, for me, it, it was always a struggle mentally and emotionally, but I guess like, I feel like I want to say like my, my sense of self knowledge and like self worth and self love mm. really helped anchor me through those, yeah. um, through all those moments of self of doubt and um, and um, concern and, and insecurity. Even though I was unsure all the time, I just wanted to try, you know, mm. or I just wanted to explore, and I believed in myself enough to want to seek it out. You know, that makes sense. Totally. But how do you continue refilling that belief? Right. I mean, one way for me is actually, you know, we talk all the time. Um, And that's why I wanted to do these series because of the lack of resources that I had, the lack of transparency. Right. Like I felt like when I was on my journey, because I'm similar to you, multifaceted, a lot of seemingly random, you know, things happening. Um, And then on top of that, whenever I would try to find someone who I thought I would want to follow as a model, 
it turned out that they had a different starting line that I did, you know, like being born to a wealthy family or, oh, they had a, a rich partner. Nothing is wrong with any of that. But when you don't know that that's why they're able to do what they do, then right. you, you compare yourself to that and then feel like a failure. So uh, for you, like, what are some of the tools that you've been able to cultivate along your journey that has helped you to kind of refill that sense of belief and confidence? Mm, that's such a great question. Tools to refill um, my, myself. I mean, definitely surround myself with good people, like you mentioned, right? I think that is something I just hold so close to me because that's like, you know, when you're around people who understand you and um, feel you and can relate to you or, and, and or just like believe in you, whether that's like your family or like your friends or like your partner, that is everything, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're not getting it in media or the rest of society, like keeping people close who can like, you know, hype you up and like keep you going, um, that is everything. Um, I, I would say that's number one. Um, my family is also a big source of motivation, you know, like sometimes I'm like, and this is, I know that like struggles aren't really comparable, but like sometimes when I think about like, oh, can I do this? Like, is this possible? I used to think about my parents' journey of when they escaped to Vietnam, you know what I mean? I'm like, they lived through like probably harder times than me and like mm -hmm. and I'm like look at what they created like they were on a boat they escaped they came to the U.S. with nothing they didn't know shit their starting line was like way back right and you know they both built businesses like a laundromat floor standing they both like have a house I mean they share a house now one of my dad you know we can go on vacations I'm like what like they did all that in their lifetime which was not very which is still very short, you know, only like a few decades. I'm like, okay, if they can do that, then I think that I can at least try to do what I want to do. That's awesome. But I think what's also unique about your parents that I love is that they are both entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I think as especially, I mean, it, I think this is common in all in, in all cultures, but especially in our, in Asian American families, right? We very much, because we're a collective culture, we want to do what's best for the family. And so that's why our parents, um, you know, support and validation does matter so much. Mm -hmm. um, and so for you, because your parents are entrepreneurs, uh, which is actually so badass to me, right? Because how are you know, they're already coming from such a, a high risk you know, history, and they still took on this risky path to starting their own business because starting your own business is like not an easy um, mental feat right yeah, yeah. so um i would just love for you to speak on how your parents kind of entrepreneurship journey how has that helped you kind of you know feel confident um, and successful because for example you know i love my parents but they did not support my creative career for a long time so that helped that that kind of made me struggle a lot on like you know me doubting or believing in my path yeah. so for you, like when you decided to start a business, uh, what was your parents' reaction? <laughs> when I when I decided to start a business, like my parents were so happy because prior to starting my business, I was very similar to you. I had a creative career, right? And I was freelancing for yeah. six years in writing, you know, documentary filmmaking, speaking, you know, workshops. Like it was my paycheck was coming from all over the place. So there was no sense of security. Mm. And, you know, similar to your parents and my parents, like they, they were, they were like proud of me. Like, Oh, that's so cool. That you can do that. But they were also like, uh, most of my mom was like, Oh, like, when are you going to get a real job? Right. Um, she just saw the path of me being like a creative entrepreneur, filmmaker, speaker, all that good stuff as just too, um, unstable. So when I started, when I told them about new cost supply, they were so supportive. Like they were all on board. Um, cause I think for them, that's a little bit more close, even though being a filmmaker, a creative freelancer, that that's also a form of entrepreneurship. Right. But I think with starting a business like new cost supply, it was more of a traditional model of business that they could understand. Like there's a product and you sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's like a clear, there's a clearer pathway and clearer metrics to like what a successful business looks like with coffee. So they were, they've been, it's tangible. It's much more tangible. Exactly. Um, so yeah, they've been super supportive um, from the very beginning. 
That's wonderful. And I um, also just want to say that I think that, again, your journey now, you know, even though you might have felt lost or random in the kind of journey to get here, um, I think that it's a full circle for you. I feel like this business is full circle for you. It really pulls from all the different parts of your life that allows you to really execute this because every piece of your journey was relevant. Um, yeah. You know, the uh, the storytelling aspect, the artistic kind of graphic design skills that you have, the um, active, the lens of activism. Um, so I, I just, you know, I wanted to point that out because if someone out there right now is listening and it's like, my path seems super random and I don't feel like I'm there yet. And I feel like I'm super lost. And I think it's super easy to feel lost, especially in this current climate that we're living in. So that's why I really wanted to um, share your story and how even though your path is not linear, it has allowed you to still come full circle. Yeah. Can I add to that point? You know, yes. um, for folks listening, you know, building off of Ruby's point, the way I've approached my path has really, you know, especially the last 10, 12 years when it was very multifaceted, I feel like I always thought of it as how I was exploring and becoming as a full human rather than just like a career person you know so all the things that I've done has helped prepare has helped develop and prepare me to be this person um to build this business right and that person is somebody with the values that I have you know the vision that I have the lens that I have the skills that I have in storytelling art design right mm -hmm. so it's a combination of like yes skills and like the professional tangibles um you know things that you learn in a path but when I think about building a career path it's really about building a path like my life path and so yeah for anyone who's like you know if you're at a stage where you're exploring multiple paths just know that it's not just about the path that you're exploring for your career you know or you know your your revenue stream it's all of that but really to prepare you as a whole human um for you to take on every new challenge that's about to come I 100% agree because starting a business, you have all of these like KPIs, right? Your key performance indicators, la, la, la. But behind that, in order to get those results, you have to be a full person that has mental, emotional, and spiritual strength to be able to keep going. Um, I always attribute in my mind, right? Like the mind of an entrepreneur or like even like a, a creative um, to that of an elite athlete, at least the successful ones, right? If you're going to be a successful entrepreneur, if you're going to be a successful creative person, you have to have the drive and the discipline of an elite athlete. Um, and I say that, uh, I love that metaphor so much because, well, once upon a time, my, my dream was to become like the Filipina Lisa Leslie. That never happened. But um, sports is such a great metaphor for me because you have to be, you have to put in the work. You have to do all of that. So um, for you, one, do you agree with that statement? And two, um, what are some of the mental hurdles that you constantly have to, that, that maybe you are not dealing with now, but you have had before? Mm -hmm. And maybe some that you are still trying to work through because regardless of who we are and how, you know, there's always a, a way for us to, an opportunity for us to grow. Um, and we're always growing through things. Um, but you know, it's the process isn't easy. And sometimes little things get in our ears or in our mind space. Like, yeah, what are those hurdles for you? Yeah, so I definitely agree with your statement of you just got to put in the work like you really do. Right. And um, I agree with also it being the path of like an elite athlete, although I would say that I probably don't train as intensely train as intensely. Really? I feel like you're always working. I don't I, know. Yeah. I am always working, but, and I don't know, this might be like in recent years, I am always working, but I, I also, I also take it really easily when I need to. And I, yeah. one thing I'm really proud of is like, I no longer beat myself up when I'm, when I want to take a break, when I call it for the day, you know, when I just want to stop, when I want to be in bed by eight, you know, like I allow all of that now. Right. Um, but to go to the, some of the mental hurdles, um, your question was about mental hurdles. Yeah, like have you ever struggled, for example, with imposter syndrome or, you know, I know that being a female entrepreneur can be very d different from a male entrepreneur experience. Yeah. You know, what are some of these things that you kind of have to jump through? 
such a good question. I'm trying to think. Um, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think back to, um, sorry, I'm trying to think back to maybe like an earlier time, like in, in regards to, you know, imposter syndrome, like I've definitely struggled with that. You know, I would say not so much anymore, but like definitely like in my early to mid twenties, yeah. um, you know, just struggling with this idea of like, can I do it? Like, am I really like you know, the one to do this or like, am I good enough? You know, I think that am I good enough has, has definitely been like a common theme, you know, in my journey. Um, because I never really felt like I was the best at anything, but I knew that I was really good at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that, like jack of all trades, master of none. And I've had moments where like, I would really beat myself up over that. I'm like, man, why am I such like a multifaceted person? Like, why can't I just be a master of one, right? Like there are moments where I actually wanted that. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I think just at the end of the day, I, I also want to say that I feel like one of the things that really keeps me motivated to work through like the imposter syndrome or to work through like this the insecurity or the uncertainty has really been like my background in activism right because mm -hmm. I just feel I feel so much injustice in the world mm -hmm. you know against you know our community you know communities of color um immigrant communities the undocumented community you know like folks like my parents like there's just so much inequity, right, and an injustice in the world. Um, there's so much lack of representation, lack of um, resources, lack of investment in our communities, that that my passion for activism rooted in my years as a youth organizer in high school and all throughout college, that is a huge motivator for everything that I do today. Right. Um, right. Uh, of just like wanting to prove people wrong, you know, right. but I want to talk a little bit more about the mental hurdles maybe you can give me like another question no 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 I think that's a really good one because I feel like one reason but sometimes you can give up very easily you can get discouraged you can come across a setback and you will get discouraged but the thing that I think will always um, make you rise back up is the connection to why you're doing what you're doing yeah um, I think because you're tied to such a bigger mission um that is something that I think continues to propel you. Yeah. But I will say, you know, in terms of uh, maybe maybe approaching that question from a different standpoint, um, what are some of the past setbacks or failures that um, maybe you have experienced that has maybe allowed you to um, make friends with uncertainty or to bounce back a little bit better? Because right now, right, like it's, a, I know that it's a very trying and challenging time for a lot of small businesses in this global pandemic that we're in. But I would argue that I think entrepreneurs are some of the most resilient people uh, because of the fact that you have to make friends with uncertainty, right? Like yeah. I think that's, you know, creatives and freelancers sing, you know, you have to kind of know how to swerve and bounce back. Um, but I'm curious to know if there has any been any setbacks that you've experienced either recently or in the past that has allowed you to understand that it's not really a setback, but like a setup for, yeah. you know, a new chapter in your journey. Yeah. Um, you know, to be honest, I, I have a hard time answering that question, probably because like the, the terms of like failure and setbacks aren't really part of my mm. thinking, you know, mm. I absolutely have challenges, I absolutely have obstacles, but I guess I just haven't processed my experience through the framework of setbacks or Oh, failures. yeah. Okay. Tell me more. <laughs> um, that would be a really helpful framework for other people listening right now. Tell yeah, me. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know why. I'm just, I, this is how I'm feeling as I'm like reflecting and listening to your questions. Um, honestly, I just feel so passionate about the work that I'm doing that, and it, I mean, I, how do I say this? I just feel so, I just believe in what I'm doing so, so deeply that um, I have honestly less uncertainty right now. But also, this has been a long journey for me. Right? Yes. Yeah. 
I think yeah. it's hard for you to kind We're of definitely going to go back to that. We're going to reel it back to that wall. Yeah. I have you me, I'm just in a different headspace right now in like my 30s. So I'm trying, I'm not, I'm trying to give you the responses, but um, I'm just less in that space. I think if you had talked to me five years ago, there would have been more there. But right now, I'm just so focused on my business. I My vision is so clear. The path for the next five years of what I need to do to build a business is so clear to me. And I have mm-hmm. so much conviction and confidence. Like, I'm not really thinking about my failure setbacks right now, honestly. I'm just thinking Yes, about I, what love I, that. I love that. I love that. So I just, know, I know that you've kind of already said it, but just to drill it back home. And so like that, you know, we have that concrete thing. So can you summarize a little bit of where that conviction comes from? Yeah. Because I know it takes time to build that conviction. It takes time, yeah. Um, I would say it's, it's, it's constant, constant work, right? And that's constant self-work of, um, you know, confronting your insecurities, confronting your doubts, um, working through them. Like, you know, like you were saying earlier, like building a relationship with all these emotions and feelings when they do arise and, no, and having building the tools, the tools within yourself to engage and understand and process why you feel uncertainty and insecurity, and then just moving forward with it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's so yes, it is constant work. And it's it and it's not like you did the work and you're there. It's like still work today to continue like, um, you know, building yourself up. Um, and also, um, I would say that it comes from just like really having, we talked about a lens of activism earlier, like, I still move through the world with my lens of activism and everything I do, whether it's my personal life, my work life. I think having a lens of like understanding the social um, and cultural and societal context of the world within you live and operate really helps to build the self-confidence conviction, right? Because if you know, if you can see like the drastic inequity and injustice in the world and where you fall within that world, Mm -hmm. for me, it gives me the fire to like just want to do more, right? And want to do better because you know, we all play a role in how this world, um, you know, is shaped and how this world treats people. So that also has really helped me build conviction and confidence of like, shit is like fucked up, you know, out there. And it's like really fucked up right now with like Ahmaud Arbery, right? Like that's all been all over the yep. social media. Yep. Um, like shit like that that comes up and it's just like, that gives me fuel to have the confidence to do what I need to do to help make the world a better place. Yeah. 100%. Like, I think that that is an advantage that I think purpose driven uh, people have, right? Because if you're attached not to your own success, but to the success of the world and the people around you, then that kind of creates a, a different. bit because maybe some people are just finding out about you through your current work right but they don't see that actually because that your your business has been featured in so many wonderful publications from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal a lot of glamorous names are um, attracted to your work and have attached to your work but can you like give some context as to like how many years you had been working before you got to that place because you know we obviously we all, we see the the end result, but we don't see. Oh, totally. Know. Yeah, no, I know. Like the headlines are really nice. The headlines are amazing. You know, they're really wonderful and well deserved. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but no, you're absolutely right. There is so there's so much that goes, so much work that goes into it, and like I'm busy all the time doing things that, like you said, that never makes to the gram. One because I'm just too tired and too busy, and too and too um, you know consumed to post my whole process on the gram, all some things just like, just don't make it to the gram. Like if I'm building financial models, you know, or if I'm in a right. house, like, <laughs> What are you gonna do, post a spreadsheet? <laughs> you know, like, and like, I think if I was younger, I would have done that just to show people that like I'm working, you know, but now, like I literally spent this, so this whole week I've been building these new models because where I'm at right now is it's my monthly report, but it's also like my, my quarterly report, but also I'm actually projecting for my next fundraising, you know, effort. So I've been so deep in financial models. Right. Um, and so little things that you just never see, you know, or, um, but yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but in terms of like, um, when I started this physics specifically, new cost supply, like the ideas started, started 
brewing um, in 2016. Such a and poet with all her <laughs> metaphors. <laughs> it started brewing really in 2016 when um, I just noticed that, you know, I was still in New York at the time. Also, I'm still here. But, you know, Vietnamese food and culture was really having, a, having its moment in New York City, I think, the country. And on a similar wavelength, I noticed that Vietnamese coffee was also becoming really trendy and popular. Um, but I noticed that people were trying to sell Vietnamese coffee on their menus, but they actually weren't using Vietnamese coffee beans, right? Which I thought was one, totally miseducation for consumers. Um, it's, it's false advertising, but most importantly, Vietnamese people and producers and farmers don't benefit from that transaction mm. of using a Vietnamese term like Vietnamese coffee as a trend, right? Like that was just problematic, right? And so then I started looking for Vietnamese coffee, but Ruby, it was so odd because even though the idea, the concept of Vietnamese coffee as a beverage was becoming popular, you actually couldn't really find a fresh roasted Vietnamese coffee bean anywhere in the market, right? So then that's when I started thinking like, okay, there's a interest here, but a huge lack, right? Right. Of supply. So that was when I first started thinking about it. And um, in 2016, actually, I was going to Cambodia to film my documentary with NBC. Asian America called Deported. And right before I flew into Cambodia, I went to visit my family in Vietnam. And I had asked them if they knew anybody who, um, you know, had a farm in Vietnam. And one of my aunts was like, I know somebody. And so that's how it all happened. We linked up, we took a, fl a plane into the lot. My aunt's in the North Hanoi. We took a plane to the lot where his farm is, who's my current producer par producing partner. And that was the first time we met in the fall of 2016. And it kind of just fell on the back burner for a few years, for a year or two, because I was still um, making films. I was still, you know, doing my freelance stuff. Um, and then by 2018, like right at the beginning of 18, I was like, okay, it's time to make this happen. So then I started actively building the company from the beginning of 2018. And then we launched it um, as direct-to-consumer through e-commerce in November 2018. Yeah. So you, for and for me and coffee supply specifically, how long did it go from brewing to like the execution? Yeah, I would say two years. Two years. But then even before that, you had been already still grinding on so many other things to get to this path. So oh, yeah. um, can you share like the number of years that you had been working as an artist and all of the development, personal and professional development that has led you to launching this company? How many years before that, before you finally met this, you know, this business? I mean, I want to say like my whole life, but really I would say, I mean, I, I would say that my journey really started like once I discovered activism in high school and then all throughout college. And then I was, before I launched New York Supply, I was a freelancer, a creative freelancer for six years. Um, I also, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'll mention this briefly, but I also um, was a part of a restaurant, a small restaurant in Brooklyn for a few years as well, which I then left to start my coffee company. So I've had, I've like, you know, I've opened a business like, like, and then I've also had a freelance journey and then I started new coffee. So like, honestly, like I would say my entire working life. So like after college, really. Yeah. I mean, I had met you when we were still in college, I think. Um, and I'm curious, I mean, we've had so many discussions, right? Internal discussions. Um, what did your younger self used to worry about and what will you tell her now? Hmm. We had a common worry before. Um, a common worry? Oh, me and you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could definitely talk about that. Um, I would say one of the things that my younger self used to worry about, I'm thinking really hard. And the, the, the thing that comes to mind is I was so worried about not being seen. Mm. And I remember this feeling, I could track this feeling back to like preschool mm. and then elementary and then in middle school and also high school. And when it started to shift was when I discovered act youth activism and youth organizing in high school where I started to discover my voice and my identity through ethnic studies, Asian American studies. Right? But I think that feeling of like not being seen you know, compounded with the model minority myth, with racism, with having parents that were immigrants, like that was always a common feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why 
throughout my entire career, I worked so hard to be seen and for our community to be seen through film, documentaries, storytelling, and now new cloth supply, right? Yeah. Um, that's when you asked, that's what, what's, that's what came to mind. Um, do you want to share our common fear from our twenties? <laughs> I think that it's important, right? Because I feel Let's like- Let's talk about it. <laughs> I know, so it, it's funny. We and Sarah used to talk, and there are a lot of young ladies who, um, you know, I think look up to you and who also, um, you know, are trying, are looking for um, female role models, right? And like as strong as a person that you are, especially in our younger days, right? Like we have long since like grew, grew out of that fear. But when we were younger, um, I know we were doing so many different things, right? And we were not, typical. I think we were also kind of um, a little bit ahead yeah. of our time in some <laughs> ways, but we were also like, you know, like I feel like in, in our, in, in that age range, right? People were worried about many other different things. Whereas we were wearing many different hats, doing all kinds of crazy things like going on tour, um, living life on, in different cities. Mm -hmm. And it felt like it was too much. You know, so, uh, and what I mean by that too much, and uh, I'm probably gonna regret talking about this. So I might cut this out. So, you know, this might be a live thing, but if you are on the live, you might catch this, but maybe it won't be later. No, but I think that in our personal life, right? We were worried, so we were worried at that time about our personal life and whether yeah. or not uh, we were too much to yeah. be able to then uh, kind of attract uh uh, a partner that would be able to. There it goes. <laughs> yeah, I know. It took a while to get there. <laughs> I'm like, so is you know. she gonna say it? I know. Sorry. So yeah. So I mean, and and we have obviously grown so much from that. But why was that such a big fear for you? Yeah. So to um, summarize, the, the fear <laughs> that I'm gonna was here. Some but... editing on that. <laughs> We were, we, Ruben and I used to commiserate so much about this fear of being single, right? Because all throughout my 20s, like I didn't have, I wasn't in a relationship for like 10 years, right? So I wasn't, I was never really sure. I had a good boyfriend in high school. Oh my like, God, we were the same. Yeah, in our which, 20s. You know, it's it was very so many, like, to me. It, it counts, you know? Yeah, but 10 I, years was like a lot of situationships. Yeah, it's situationships. So I never had a relationship in all throughout college and all throughout my early and mid 20s. Like I didn't have my next relationship, my first adult relationship until I was like 27, right? And so imagine me being 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, single as fuck the whole time, <laughs> and just like freaking out, you know what I mean? And of course, like for the beginning, it's like, it's fine, I'm fine. But then like you hit 24, 25, 26, and you're like, is this going to happen, right? I was so um, worried about being single because like you were saying, Ruby, it was, we were on a very unconventional path. We were doing our thing. We were like very ambitious. We were very loud, outspoken. And I used to feel like, I don't know, like I couldn't find somebody who, who, wanted to be with me but I mean, well and one time my my dad even told even my dad told me you're too opinionated and you're and he yeah. was always like you might be too much yeah you know? it might be too much yeah too much yeah and maybe I was too much you know what I mean but like so what so what right so now when we think of when the, the whole idea of being too much now right like I don't even have that fear anymore because why would I want to be in a partnership anyway where I couldn't be my full self right right yeah. And so now it's so awesome because I know that you are, have like a success story because now you have a partner who we see all the time on the gram and he's super supportive. Um, you know, you don't have to share too much, but is there a little tidbit of what you could share about the success that you found in your personal life as well? Oh yeah. Oh wow. I love the, I like this, the direction we're going. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, you know, I, I remember during the period where I was single and fearful of being single forever. I remember feeling um, moments where I would have to like dumb my shine, you know, be less of me mm. to make the, to help make other person feel more comfortable, you know, um, because we live in this very like heteronormative patriarchal society where like men want to feel a certain way and women need to be a certain way. And I actually had most where I was like, oh, maybe that's just kind of like 
I, I don't want to change myself, but maybe I just kind of like hold back a little bit. So like they're comfortable, right? Which is the wrong way to do it. You never want to do that. Never want to do that because you should be able to be who you are and, you know, the right person who is the right person for you will embrace you exactly as you are, right? 100%. Yeah. So, so, so me, if, I mean, yes, yeah, so now I am in an amazing, um, you know, relationship with my life partner, Eric, who just supports me, you know, um, in all parts of my life, personal and professional. And we have such a great partnership and it's just like so much fun. And, you know, I don't really know what, um, what I even did there. I think it was part of it's like luck and timing, but also I think just being for me personally, just reaching a point where I was just comfortable and happy with myself and I was accepting of myself and I wasn't going to change myself for anybody. And when you, when you're on that wavelength of like openness and acceptance, right. You're going to attract that type of energy mm -hmm. of like absolutely acceptance and, and and so now we're in a very like accepting and loving relationship together yeah yeah 100 like i feel like radical self-worth is so cha life-changing like i think that when you value and honor yourself and just are able to express the fullness of who you really are then you also get to be uh able to attract friendships and, uh, you know, business partners and life partners that are able to kind of move in the same way that you do. Right. So I appreciate also want, I also want to thank you. I also want to add, you know, to that, like, you know, I met Eric, who's now my partner when, when I was 30. Right. And like, sometimes we just all need time, you know, like I, I need time to grow and, you know, my future partner needed time to grow. So like, I wasn't going to meet him in my twenties, right? Because he wasn't ready and I would have been ready. And so some, so if you're like, for anyone who's out there, if you're like frustrated, like sometimes we need time and your future partner needs time. So it's all good. And, you know, you being on your wavelength, there's a real possibility that your pool of people, your pool of partners or your pool of friends, it may be smaller because most of the world, you know, we live in a very like, like fucked up world, you know? So like your pool of people may be smaller, but it doesn't, but it's, but you will find them. Right. Uh, I think just for me is being okay with like, okay, maybe I won't have like 10 relationships because maybe my pool of people, the people that I want is just a smaller pool because yeah. I have like a very high standard. Right. Yep. Um, and that's okay. Right. So just like understanding yeah. that as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I didn't expect to go that route either, but I'm glad that we did. I feel like um, this is, I think it's important to show the personal and professional successes, right? Yeah. Like I feel like we, um, especially, well, I live in France now, so I think my lifestyle is so different from what it's like in New York, but I feel like um, there's a lot of emphasis on these different types of achievements that are measurable, uh, but we also need to prioritize personal success, you know, and what you talked about earlier about being able to set boundaries for yourself now. Um, you know, I feel like I'm the same way. I'm no longer feeling like I'm a workaholic. You know, if I need to stop working, I will work because guess what? When you are able to give yourself that resting period, the next time you do go to work, it's more productive and the quality is better. Yeah. But then also, just being able to know that your life is um, has many different parts and success isn't just about the professional um, accolades, but it's really about, you know, your relationships um, and how you treat people because you could be an activist and be good to everybody else. But if you're not good to yourself, if you're not good to your immediate family or your close circle of friends, what is that, you know, really doing, right? So I think what I enjoy and love about your journey is the fact that you have such a close relationship with your family. Mm -hmm. You're so close to your parents. You miss them so much all the time. And then you have this amazing um, life partner. So it just gives a full picture to, I think, the successes that you have that I think um, is worth um, aspiring for. Thanks, so, Thanks for reflecting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me here on the show. Um, and thank you to everybody who uh, got a chance to tune in. I know that there's somebody from Houston, from San Bernardino, uh, Rina. Hi, Maya's tuning in from Tokyo. Hi, Maya. <laughs> yes. And um, Justin is from California. So we appreciate if you're still here with us at the end of this stream. 
we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. So thank you all. And a new episode of Grit and Glamour will come out in a few days. But in the meantime, uh, please follow Sarah's work. And I'll let Sarah tell you where to find her. Oh, you can find me at NuyenCoffeeSupply.com um, or One Ounce Gold on Instagram. Perfect. Well, thank you all again for joining us and hope that you tune in again at a future time to get a hold of all of these honest and transparent conversations about the grind toward the glow up that you don't see on the gram. Until next time. Bye. Bye, Ron. <laughs>